usually do. So first of all, um, happy fall, everybody, and, and welcome Rockville Art Re League artists. A few announcements, uh, general announcements before we get going. Um, as far as today's Zoom, please keep yourself on mute. But if you have a question, uh, unmute yourself and, and ask it. And um, and hopefully that'll work efficiently and it, and it'll it'll be fine. But for if you're just listening, please keep your your machine on mute. Uh, thanks to the many members who have renewed their membership for the year September 1, 23 through August 31st, 24. And for those of you who haven't renewed yet, we hope you will because we need you. And um, without you, we can't do the things we do, which includes these talks. <laughs> Our October newsletter will go out early next week. Please look at it and read it. The December winter jury show call is in the newsletter. Uh, and Lisa has done a, a write up to include, you know, some details that are important. I will be sending out uh, to those individuals who have renewed your personal link and password. You'll need that password and link to enter our jury show and all shows this year. <laughs> I've got a little cough here, so um, excuse me if I interrupt once in a while. But now let's get to the important thing. Um, we are both honored and fortunate to be welcoming Dr. Arena Stotland back to speak with our league. This marks the seventh year that you've kicked off our year. And it, it doesn't seem possible. Um, and it's quite a tradition. So thank you, Dr. Arena. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, she judged, she also, in addition to speaking seven years in a row, she also judged our spring jury at art show in 22. Dr. Stotland, Stotland received her PhD from Bryn Mawr and is an internationally recognized expert on the life and art of Paul Gauguin. She is fluent in at least four languages, and she's also fluent in art history from the earliest iconography to abstract expressionism. <laughs> Most of you know about Vermeer's Girl with the Pearl Earring, and this evening with Dr. Stotland's help, we're gonna learn more about Vermeer, his life, his times, and yes, he did other artworks as well, not too many, but we'll learn more about those. So, um, Arena, thank you again for joining us, and uh, I'm turning it over to you now. Okay, um, I'm gonna share the screen. Okay, let me hide this. One second. All the bars on your screen will disappear in a second. So, just a couple of things. I am not fluent in four languages, unfortunately. <laughs> I have two, maybe two and a half. Um, and another thing, but thank you, Patrick. I should not have probably outed myself. But um, the other thing is, he, so I just, in the interest of managing time a little bit more efficiently, if you can hold your questions until I'm done speaking, then we can have a discussion. Okay. Otherwise, I do. I can't promise that we'll stick to the to the time limit. Okay. And you can uh, write in your questions into the chat, but I will. I can't check it as I'm talking because of the way that Zoom is, is set up. So I'll read it at the end of the lecture. Okay. Okay. Any any questions before we start? Please unmute yourself and uh, let me know. No. Okay, so today's lecture is on Johannes Vermeer, who is one of the most known artists in the West. And um, we see his images everywhere, right? Mouse pads, fridge magnets, t-shirts. There are all sorts of variations on the theme of the girl with the pearl earring. There was a movie that came out, which unfortunately added to many, many mis misconceptions that people have. <laughs> Vermeer, and I'm going to try to clear them up today. So the title of the lecture is The Secrets of Johannes Vermeer, 
but these secrets are not truly secrets. I, you know, I'm not the sort of open open knowledge. I'm just I, I am sort of collecting them for you, and hopefully you will see that he consistently uses certain things in his paintings and becomes easily recognizable um, and identifiable as as a Vermeer. Okay, so let's start a little bit with a little bit of his uh, biography. So he is born, lives, and dies in the city of Delft, um, which was an important city at the time. It wasn't the capital, but it was an important sort of provincial city. Um, he is born into a middle-class family. His father is a sort of an artist. You can say he's a textile artist. He's a silk worker, which is a very important industry um, in Northern Europe. And his father also keep, he's an art dealer. So he deals with art on a daily basis and Vermeer sees it around himself um, since he is a child. And his father also runs an inn. Now it might seem like a weird combination <laughs> to have with your profession, but it's a very common one because uh, being an artist or being a craftsman wasn't as, you know, wasn't a very stable sort of source of income. So people kept multiple things going. Um, his father wasn't a great businessman, so he was in debt. And when Vermeer inherited his inn and his art dealer business, he also inherited those debts. So Vermeer was never independently wealthy, let's put it that way. We don't know if Vermeer had any formal training. Uh, we have no record of him being an apprentice at the studio, which was the way things were run, a sort of communal training for an artist. Um, but there, from looking at what he is producing, it seems that he was, first of all, a genius, and second of all, that he did have some sort of technical background. Um, he's too good not, not to have picked up something um, as he was evolving as an artist. We do know that he, uh, as an adult, as an artist, he becomes a member of the Guild of St. Luke, which is the only way you can work as an artist in the 17th century. You have to be a member of the Artist Guild. And an Artist Guild is a St. Luke's Guild. He's the patron saint of all artists, and you have to pay your dues. So he becomes um, very well established, very well known within the city. And he becomes, um, nine years later, he becomes the head of the guild. And he's actually re-elected to the position three times, which should tell you something about his reputation as an artist. Um, he marries, and unlike the movie tells you, it's actually a love match. There is no affair with the servant. That never happens. We actually do know this. Um, why do we know it's a love match? Because in the context of this cultural sort of divide that is still ongoing in the 17th century between the Catholics and the Protestants, which is remarkably pronounced in Northern Europe, um, the cities, you know, you still have Catholic communities within the cities of Northern Europe, even though it's sort of problematic because sometimes they're prohibited from doing certain things. But Vermeer marries a Catholic woman. She is older than he is. She is also wealthier than he is. But by all accounts, it's, um, it's a good marriage. It's a good relationship because Vermeer is not financially Secure, uh, all of them live with um, his wife's mother, with his, his mother. Um, and they have 15 children in total, uh, four die in infancy, so there are 11 children in the house. Um, Vermeer, for all his fame now, right? And you'd be hard pressed to find a person in the West who doesn't know who Vermeer is. He is virtually unknown outside of his city. And there are several reasons for that. So he is the only artist in the 17th century to use the most expensive pigment at the time. It is very, very, very expensive. 
it's lapis lazuli, the blue pigment. And he is the only one to use it so lavishly and so thoroughly throughout his career. So before he paints something with that much of an expense invested, um, he needs to sell either things as an art dealer or the other pain paintings that he produced. He's incredibly meticulous and detailed in the art, in his output. So he works very slowly. He has no pupils to help him, no apprentices, no studio. So he produces about three paintings a year. And we know that in total, he had produced less than 50. We have 35 that we now sort of claim as Vermeer paintings. And there are no drawings that survived. Um, and to add to all of this, he has 11 children. He is an art dealer. He is an innkeeper. He is the head of the guild. And so all of that sort of slows down the productivity. And another factor is that he has one major patron that buys almost all of Vermeer's work and that patron is local. So almost all of Vermeer's paintings stay in Delft. So all of that together means that people don't really know him. He was sort of rediscovered in, uh, during the 19th century by a French writer um, and hence started the sort of craze that we are part of now. So he is, we don't, again, we don't know if he had any formal training, but he's very much influenced by basically the, the this conventional sort of range of artists that people are influenced by during the Dutch Baroque. It is Leonardo da Vinci's studies on the um, relationship between colors and how surface takes on a little bit of the color of the adjacent object. He is very much influenced by the greatest Baroque artist, arguably Caravaggio, an Italian Baroque artist, but he knows about Caravaggio through the local sort of followers, the Utrecht Caravaggisti, people that, you know, uh, Northern European artists that take on Caravaggio as an inspiration. Everybody is, in, is influenced by Rembrandt during this time. It, it, he is no exception. And then finally, he's sort of part of this larger group in within the Dutch Republic called the Leiden Fine Painters. That's the name that we put on them. But fine painters is what they are called because they are meticulously detailed and produce these perfectly illusionistic paintings with no sign of sort of human labor, no trace of the hand. So how do you recognize a Vermeer? Um, it's gonna be a contemporary to him, 17th century Dutch subject. Um, most of his work is about, is set within a domestic Dutch interior. You're gonna have one to three figures in a painting um, usually. It's going to be of a smaller format. If you've ever been at an exhibition of Vermeer, you know, it's surprising how tiny the paintings are. And he has a sort of a cooler palette and this incredibly realistic observation of light. Now, one of the biggest controversies, which I think is sort of overemphasized as a controversy, is this whole discussion whether or not Vermeer used a tool uh, to help him produce hyper naturalistic paintings and the tool is called camera obscura so i actually flipped it by mistake but the way camera obscura works is you have a box and you place it you either build it within a room where you work as an artist within your studio and you place it opposite of a window and you make a hole a tiny pinhole in the in the side of that box and when the light from the window comes in, whatever landscape, whatever you see outside of your window is gonna be reflected on the opposite wall of the box, but upside down. So then people make these boxes in various sizes. They make them portable and also put mirrors inside of them. So the image is not upside down. And you know this is what it could be, sort of a large, I just flipped it, sorry, a large box built in the studio. And there is a pinhole and there is a tree and this is how it's reflected. But this tree should be upright and the reflection should be upside down. So this is a sort of a portable camera obscura where you have a mirror 
put within the box and it reflects the image on the bottom of the box. And then you just put a piece of paper down and just trace the image. So this is very roughly what camera obscura is. Um, now there are people who are arguing for Vermeer's use of it and against Vermeer's use of it. What I think is that it ultimately doesn't matter because the genius and the beauty of Vermeer's paintings cannot be really, you know, you can't explain it only by him using the camera obscura. This was a tool that was readily available. And if that was the secret, we would have had thousands of Vermeer's, but we don't. So what are the arguments against him using the camera obscura? Well, we have a very detailed inventory of Vermeer's household. And there is no camera obscura in that inventory, even though it accounts for various things, very detailed sort of accounting. Now, what are the arguments for his use of it? When you get this image through the camera obscura, because um, it's a, you know, even if you use a mirror, even if you use like a lens, so, which some people have, because it's sort of primitive contraption, it creates optical defects. It creates the so-called lens blur spots. And you see in Vermeer these very interesting, very so secular, uh, I mean, very circular spots, which, you know, I'm zooming in here, but we would read as highlights all together. They're called pointy. Um, but this is the effect that camera obscura would produce if you use it. And then you have other things there. He has a very close uh, other factors that speak for his use of camera obscura. He has a very close friendship with a very famous scientist at the time who actually invented a type of a microscope. So obviously, this is the guy who is interested in optics and who is his best friend. So it's not that much of a logical leap to think that camera obscura was discussed. And then within Vermeer's paintings, besides for these specular highlights, you also have interesting things. Like we know that he didn't have rigorous formal training at the minimum. At the maximum, he had no training, but he produces these hyper-realistic images. So camera obscura would be, again, a logical sort of conclusion here. Um, and on top of that, there are no drawings attributed to him, and there are very few preparatory traces under the oil. So somehow he, this perfect image just lands on his canvas. And another thing, and we're going to discuss this, he has within his paintings a range of focuses. So it's not just a, a sort of a focal point, but he will have multiple focal points, which is another thing that can be produced by camera obscura, especially if you move it to get the complete picture, a complete reflection here. So we're gonna see how that works out in his paintings. So this is secret number one, if you can call it that. I'm gonna go through some of the categories of his works. I'm not, I can't cover all of them, but these are the most sort of Vermeer categories that we're gonna talk about. So this is girl reading a letter at an open window. Um, we dated between 1657 and 1659. That's the most accurate that scholars can come up with. And it belongs to this fairly large category of the letters. So images of women reading the letters and writing the letters. So I'm gonna point out some things to you that you can find that almost all of Vermeer's paintings. First of all, there is, you can call it the Vermeer's composition. So you have either a solitary figure or two figures. At the most, you will have three figures within these domestic spaces. And the space is gonna be filled with natural light. It's gonna be this luminous um, space that he's presented to us. We are always looking at these figures from a viewpoint that is slightly below them. We're looking up at them, which monumentalizes the figure, makes it the center, makes it the most important sort of thing within the composition. And you will 
always or almost always, nine times out of 10, in Vermeer will have some sort of a barrier in the foreground. Here, he is already, this is one of his mature, not mature, this is one of his most developed uh, works. So he already has perfected the perspectival arrangement here. Everything is absolutely correct. So this is this works according to the linear perspective. We have the horizon line over here. It's in the geometric center of the canvas. And then if you follow the converging orthogonals, which is the window sill at the bottom and the, the I guess, the frame the upper frame here. So if you follow these two converging lines, and you see that they are uh, being foreshortened, right, into the background, they converge onto this vanishing point that touches somewhere on the frame of this painting. So what happens is the vanishing point is located behind the barrier and connects the monumental figure to the wall painting. And this is a thing that happens frequently in Vermeer. So an interesting point about the painting, the painting was covered up at some point after Vermeer's death. And it was only uncovered, restored to the original condition in 2017. And a lot of people were very unhappy about this painting. They thought, they thought it looked better without the addition, but the scholars, because of the chemical and the x-ray and you know other technical analysis, they actually figured out that this was the original composition as it was intended by Vermeer. And when you get to the interpretation of the painting, it actually makes a lot of sense. So another, so we've talked about the composition and the perspective, Vermeer's light. In Vermeer, you will have the most accurate representation or scientific representation of the behavior of light, how light is diffused, how it interacts with color, how it is reflected. So with Vermeer's paintings, you have this sort of unity. It, light acts as a unifier of space. Everything works together because there is this luminosity, sort of like an envelope of light within the painting. You will never have candlelight, you will never have moonlight, and you will never have direct sunlight. You will have this subtle, clear, specifically Dutch atmospheric reality. There are over 300 rainy days at this point in time of the Dutch Republic. It's probably the same right now. You have extremely limited sunlight, especially during winter and you don't have intense sunshine, which is why when the when houses are built, if you can afford it, because windows, the glass is expensive, windows are built as large as possible, like over here, it's a giant window, and it's sometimes about two thirds of the wall. So this is what you can expect from Vermeer in the depiction of light. And to just point this out again, if you zoom into this, to the head, of this young woman, her hair is full of these specular highlights. When we zoom out, you read this as reflection of light because she's standing right opposite of this sort of wave of luminosity that comes in. The lifelikeness, how do we crack this secret? So he's incredible naturalism in the representation of the space and the objects within it has to do with light, but also have to do with the way that he organizes space. And it is a very intentional, very rational, formal relationship between the elements within the pictorial space. They create specific visual rhythms for us as the viewer, and it's it guides us to, in reading the painting, very gradually. It's a very sort of slow dynamic that he builds for us. And it's very subtle. So I'm going to point out some things to you. And I'm sure if you spend some time with the painting, again, it's not a secret. It just requires a certain time spent with the painting. So you have 
the window, you have the wall painting, you have the curtain, and you have the table. All of these elements are objects, right? They're inanimate, and they act to sort of enclose the human body. You see this, correct? So how are we directed to view this, to read this? So you have the green curtain, and then you have the same color, slightly more yellow, I think, because of the light hitting it, in the sleeve. And these are parallels, the parallel of the arm here and the parallel, oh, it's sort of bowing out parallel. Do you see it over here? Then you have, so it connects the curtain to the sleeve, right? And it clarifies the spatial relationship of the body in space. The body is between the curtain, is, is between the curtain and the table on one side and the painting on the other side. There is another parallel here. It's the angle of the turn of the bowl of foot and the angle of the hands and a little bit of the forearms holding the letter. So that gives us the direction. It, it Again, it's the spatial relationship is clarified the bowl, the table, and the curtain vis-a-vis -vis the body. But then it also directs us to the most illuminated portion of this part of the pictorial field, which is the letter, which is very important to the meaning of the composition. Okay, then you have this sort of open part of the window, the window glass, and the way that it is opened clarifies, which could be a very confusing spatial relationship between the window and the painting. It lets us know that this is a corner of the room, right? Also, the shadows let us know that as well, the light and the shadows. Then it sort of directs us, because there is an, a corner here, to the chair. And the chair clarifies the relationship between the table and the wall. Again, it sort of emphasizes there is a corner there. And it's so dark that it creates a contrast once again to the most illuminated passage, which is the, the letter, right? Okay, so all of these things are very subtle, but once you start noticing them, you see that there is very thought out organization of space in Vermeer. And in most of his paintings, the props that I just listed for you are the same. He actually paints a lot of his scenes in the same room. He will, except for one painting, he will always have the light come through the same window on the left. The light usually comes through that side. Okay, so what are the Vermeer's props? You have the Spanish chair, as it was called, uh, with the finials on top, with the you know the light reflecting off of the brass um, or on the leather, you have the rug called Turkish, but that could go for any Middle Eastern rug really at the time. They are so expensive that they are never kept on the floor; they're always put on the table, sort of very expensive tablecloth. Um, this is a Chinese bowl that frequently figures in his in his work, and this is where we would get. Um, a little bit of the symbolism, a little bit of the meaning comes in. You have a hot peach over here. So it's there is a Dutch poem that uh, goes like, send apples, send pears, or other fruit to win over your lover. And so there is a very sort of conventional link between love and fruit, or women and fertility, all of that comes together. Um, the curtains. So you have two curtains in this painting. You have the red curtain, which comes from Caravaggio. He is a big fan of this big dramatic silk curtain. And then the green one that is Vermeer's color, really. Um, and so curtains have a very long history in art um, as a trompe l'oeil, as a trick of the eye. So it's in the, the story how you can trick the eye and how important it is for an artist to be super illusionistic can be traced back to a story from ancient Greece where two artists were competing, um, Zeuxis and Parasius. And Zeuxis 
drew a bunch of grapes and he fooled the birds. They came to peck at the grapes. But Parasius actually fooled the human eye of Zeuxis because he painted a curtain and Zeuxis tried to open it. So Parasius won as the more perfect artist. And so during the 17th century, since we get this incredible naturalism as an objective, as an aesthetic objective of the Baroque, you get still lives like this that trick the eye. So this is where um, Vermeer is looking. The importance of the letter. So you don't just get the most highlighted passage, which is the letter. You don't just have the line of vision of this girl looking down at the letter. You don't have. You don't just have that as a sort of um, center conceptually. You also have this reflection of the girl's head looking at the letter again. So the, there are two lines of visions directing towards the letter. And if you look at this closely, you'll see that the reflection shouldn't be shouldn't be here if she's placed this way. And we know from technical research that he's moved the body, but left the reflection there. So it is very intentional in the way that it uh, points to the letter as the conceptual and formal focal point of the painting. So the Dutch Republic at this point has the highest rate of literacy. Women even know how to read and write. And there is a this craze, this fashion for writing love letters. There are manuals about it. Um, in Dutch art, women with, later, with letters are associated with love. And so if you put this together with the open window and with the wall painting of the Cupid, Right, the open window means she's looking outside of the house. She's sort of extending her world outside the domestic uh, spheres and the fruit, which is a symbol of carnal passion and Cupid, which is also a symbol of carnal passion together. So there is, this is a love letter. She's reading a love letter and there is some sort of a relationship that she is very intensely sort of following by reading the letter. She's completely absorbed in this activity. Another example of a woman reading a letter, 1662-1665. Um, this is a more mature painting and you have less clutter in the room, less and less clutter as time goes on. What you have there again is this use of space um, in, with incredible intentionality to to point out to us who is, the, what is the main action here? So the map is of Holland um, and it's a very important one. We also know that the jacket, this wonderful blue silk jacket that she's wearing, it has been identified, it, uh, it was only worn by well off women and it was worn, um, it's a bed jacket. So you wear this in bed. So we know basically that she just gotten out of bed to read the letter. She just received the letter. And then you have the map of Holland there. So she's probably reading this. She is a married woman um, wearing sort of the clothes that are befitted of a married woman. So she's probably reading a letter from her traveling husband. So the most interesting thing about this um um, about this painting is this, as I mentioned, this sort of range of focuses in the painting. What you should notice here is that he does this incredibly, it's an unprecedented thing. So you have this monumental human body, which is enveloped by all this furniture again, right? Nobody can come in from the right because the chair is there. You can't, you can barely sort of, you can't really come in from the front. There's a table and there is another chair in the back. She's very sort of, she's locked in by, by these ge geometric objects there. Now, if you look at the painting closely, you're gonna see it that, you know, we have more details. It's much more focused on the peripheral object rather than on the figure. She is much more fuzzy than the chairs, for example. 
So it's almost like the camera zooms in and zooms out. Um, there are, which means that there are several focal points, which nobody does during um, during this time with that sort of within that sort of um, uh, language, pictorial language. So the chairs are in optical focus. This female is very stark against the wall, uh, the wall, very sort of another focal uh, optical focus. And the figure itself, it's the largest presence. It's the most monumental presence, but it's a little fuzzier. So he, all, he, he, he sort of democratic, dem, there is a democratization of the pictorial face in Vermeer, pictorial space in Vermeer. So you have your eye, you almost become conscious of how your eyes focus on things. And you move from more detail to less detail. So it's all, almost like center and periphery are in this persisting flux, which goes very well with the contemporary, contemporary to Vermeer theories of vision. And this idea that human vision is imperfect and the eye gets distracted and it could focus on the insignificant, right? Away from the main subject, while the main subject and the composition is focusing on the truly important thing, the words of her love, who is traveling. A maid, the lady, and the love letter. So this is a little bit different and much more humorous, I find, in this painting. This is the love letter 1669 to 1670. You can tell the, who the lady is, she's much more opulently dressed. Uh, and there is a maid standing behind her, but there's a great amount of closeness and intimacy between these two figures, no matter the social divide between them. Um, and the maid seems to be more in control of things here. So it's a love letter, again, how do we know this? So she's holding a lute and there are these removed slippers. Both of these things are symbols of passion of carnal love, you have the sweeping that has been forgotten. She has forgotten her domestic duties, her duty to cleanliness in favor of making music and reading a letter. So it's sort of a moralizing tone over here. And then finally, you have the two wall paintings, which are always a clue in Vermeer. You have a man traveling on the road over here in the landscape, and then you have a storm at seas. So there is the absent man, and this is what looks like, you know, storming sea is a conventional metaphor at the time of a tempestuous love affair. So there it is. And again, you have the barrier of the curtain, and you have the light coming in from our left. Another category um, that is all present in Vermeer is the category of the courting couples. And specifically here, it's a subcategory of the drinking scenes. So during Vermeer's time, the rules of courtship were a little bit relaxed. So we get these sort of scenes. Uh, they previously belonged in the so-called brothel scenes. Prostitutes would drink and converse with men. Now it's a little bit more sort of relaxed and you get, you get these sort of flirtatious scenes between the middle class. People. So this is Officer and Laughing Girl from 1657. This is the Frick. So this is fairly accessible. So what's the barrier here in the foreground? You don't have a curtain, but you have this hulking guy with the ginormous hat. The hat is way too big. It's very much exaggerated, but his silhouette acts as a barrier. We can't really enter into this very private um, dialogue that they have going on. The whole composition is built on contrast. You have this bright red of his jacket that's contrasted with the black um, of his hat. The tablecloth, it lost some of its pigment, but it was actually green. So that's another contrast between red, green, and the yellow of her dress. And then you have this contrast. So you have the negative space, this wedge shape of the wall that creates a distance a psychological distance between the couple. And then you have the sort of descending diagonals of their arms. So this is sort of the eventuality of them touching, getting even closer here. So the girl most likely was um, 
was uh, modeled on Vermeer's wife. And she's smiling, she's full of optimism, and she's in this direct, well, not direct, but she is illuminated by the sun. Um, now, the way that she's holding her wine glass is important. So there is a manual for painters that's published at the time, which says that the way you represent a sitter holding the glass will sort of uncover their social position. So she's holding it in the position number five, which is the most refined princely position. So she seems to be from the upper echelons of society. In contrast to that, the dress that she's wearing is the everyday dress, and she's wearing an apron on top of it, which indicates that she was doing her chores and he has surprised her, which is not okay. That's not an okay behavior. That's not how you court the lady. You have to make an appointment. You can just come in when she is dusting. So the guy is a military officer because uh, he's wearing red. There is no uniform, but they do wear these bright, recognizable colors on um, on the battle during the battle, so they can be identified. So we know that he is an officer because of the black sash, and we know he is well off because of his hat. That's a beaver hat, which was very expensive and very exotic. And it was an import from the New Netherlands, which was under the Dutch West India Company's control from the Americas. So what is the meaning of it? So the meaning is actually tied to the map. The Dutch are the leaders of cartography. So maps are in every household and in almost all of the paintings of the interiors. And maps are symbolic of Dutch sort of dominance of world trade, Dutch knowledge, Dutch power. So there are several sort of interpretations of the scene here. I think that it's very much about, you know, the military, the Dutch military connected to the map, which is the Dutch uh, dominance. His head is right there slicing into the map. Um, and there is also this sort of conventional symbolism of love as a military campaign. So there she is, a very Dutch girl, <laughs> being sort of conquered by the Dutch military. So you do get a little bit of humor in Vermeer. Um, there are the music making scenes, also of courting couple. This is the music lesson in uh, England. What is very interesting about this is the way that he pays this incredible attention to the shadows and he uses the shadows to create the composition. So if you look here, there are shadows that are falling from the window and they fall down to the floor and they sort of start or fall into the diagonals of the tiles and that connects the left side of the painting, which is empty of the clutter to all of the objects on the right side of the painting. It creates a unified space. So the center, the vanishing point of the composition is the standing girl who is playing on a musical instrument called the virginal. And that's important. There you have a music teacher on the side. And the wall painting has been identified as uh, Simon and Pero. Now, what he is connected to are the bound arms, which is a symbol, a metaphor of self-restraint. And what you have above the virginal is the mirror, which is a symbol of vanity. So again, there are, you know, music is a matter of, is sort of symbolic of love. There you have the sort of highly dangerous situation of a young woman alone with a young man. So it's sort of a moralizing message there. Um, uh, a girl at the mirror is also, you know, symbolic of sort of losing your looks it's used as an allegory of old age. Um, now, the final painting I'm going to show you before we run out of time uh, is an example of a cityscape that uh, Vermeer is famous for. So this is the Little Street, 1657 to 1658. And this is a genre that is invented by the Dutch, the genre of the urban scene the cityscape. It doesn't exist before this moment, doesn't exist in any other culture. And this is the genre that grows out of map making. It grows out of cartography. It doesn't 
It has nothing to do with the religious paintings and the landscapes um, that act as a background in the early Renaissance. This is very specific to the cultural moment. So what happens with the mirror, he takes this Dutch innovation and he makes it his own. Um, so conventionally within these urban scenes, the focus, it would, it would be a reflection of reality, but it would be selective re uh, um, reflection of reality. The focus would be the best panoramic view, right? So you would pick and choose things that look the best. What he does is he narrows it down even further to a particular moment in time. So it becomes that much more personal of a view. So it is an incredible painting. I, I find that people spend the most time in front of this painting uh, because it is so incredibly lifelike. So it is not symmetrical, but it is very balanced. So you have the door that is not in the center of the house, right? The house is cut off. You have the red shutter that offsets the whole thing to the right. And then it even more disbalanced by the two shutters in the contrasting color, green to red, and two of them instead of one. Um, you have open shutters and open windows, and then you have closed shutters, um, closed and open doors. You know, So it's not truly symmetrical. It's not a reflection of each other, but it's very balanced. You have this. So, we call it a scrutinizing eye. So he paints it that way and he makes it, us see it that way. He makes it, us stop and look at all of these little details, at the right angles, at the, that cut the sky into a triangle here or into a wedge over here. This incredible tactility that is present in the painting. You have the stones and the brickwork, and it's sort of impastoed. So it's tactile in texture as well as visually. And then finally, what you get here on the sort of conceptual level is what I mentioned. He picks a moment in time that he, you know, it's selective, it's his own. And we get both the feeling of time passing, and we the time passing we get from the sky. There are clouds in the sky, another Dutch innovation by Ruisdale, a landscape artist. So the clouds are moving, they're filtering the sunlight, um, air is moving through the house because there are two doors open and the window open. Uh, time is passing because there is this, there are water stains on the whitewash, um, there are bricks that are falling out, there is the peeling and paint and cracks in the wall. So time is passing, wind is moving, clouds are filtering the light. So we, we feel that, that sort of movement that he's giving to us. But you also have the pause. You have a halted moment and that is given to us by the figures. The figures that are completely absorbed in what, is, in what they're doing, so the time they're not noticing the time. They're not counting the minutes. So you have the women that are absorbed in their chores. And then you have the two children over here absorbed in their game. And while they absorb, time moves. Um, and, uh, you know, things go on. So let me stop here. I've talked for 50 minutes. So let me see if you've written something into the chat. But please unmute yourself. Um, if you let's let's talk about the things and if you have any any questions about anything or any comments, I don't see I don't see any any questions in the chat. Um, do you, do you have any questions that you would like to voice? You have to unmute yourself first. I, I would like to hear you talk a little more about his colors, the colors he selects. So he has a very limited range of colors, as you can see, because, um, because of the effect of naturalistic light he wants to produce. 
So you have sort of sub, the subdued northern light, and then you have the subdued but saturated colors. So as I said, the most expensive color he's using is this ultramarine, the lapis lazuli, which is incredibly, incredibly expensive. And he uses it, uses it in every painting. Um, it, most famously in the girl with the pearl earring. Uh, but here you see it in the skirt. Right? Oh. Here, there is this blue of the chair and also the blue in the rug. He will also add, as time goes on, as he becomes more and more sort of comfortable with his style, um, this geometry, the linear perspective is going to become secondary to him and he will arrange the composition through color, through the interactions between colors and how light reflects on the color. So the range of color is not as important as the dynamic between light and color. Okay, so we know he used, I believe it was about 20 colors, which is not that much. Um, about 20 pigments in his composition. And, you know, you will have the saturated red, you will have the saturated blue, you will have the gold, this sort of saturated um, yellow, and then white, which has blue in it, because that's the way that he is conveying the shadows to us. Okay? Thank you. Any, any other questions? No, no questions. Well, did he, did he, you know, um, what they would get the pigment all ground and stuff. He did have somebody mixing his paints. There was a true to that girl with the pearl earring. No, with. Um, so it is possible that a trusted servant, a trusted maid would do this, but it needed, it, it most likely he did it himself because this was not, something that you can do without training. So it is possible that he trained somebody to help him, uh, but we think that most likely it was himself, that he wasn't really letting go of the, of the control over the quality of his pigment. And also there was never any mention of like mentors that he did paint with or anything. He was sort of self-taught. So, there is no record of his formal training and who his teachers were. It is possible, um, you know, there was another famous movie based on another famous book, The Goldfinch. So it is possible that he was um, trained by Fabricius, but there is no, no evidence to it. It's just sort of a conjecture. Arena, the, the very first uh, image you showed us painting, you said it had recently been restored. Well, 27, wait, 2021, yes. Um, and you said that some people kind of liked it before it was restored. Yeah, yeah. What, uh, what exactly came out when they restored it? That, so that this, whole, this whole wall painting was hidden. It looked like just an empty wall. You didn't have the cupid. So somebody thought that it looks better without the, the painting of the Cupid. So at some point, an owner decided they didn't like Cupid and painted yeah, over it. Pretty much. <laughs> any, any other questions I can answer for you? OK, I guess. Um, I had more images to show you, but I'm over time, so I sort of stopped. <laughs> no, no, please, please show us some more. Oh, you sure? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, I thought I was going to stick to the time limit. Okay, so um, I have another, sorry, this painting is very heavy, so it sticks to it a little. I have another example of his um, cityscape. This is another very famous landscape by Vermeer. This is the view of Delft, which is in the Hague. 1660 to 63. This is the largest of his works. This is um, almost 39 by 40, about 46 inches. So it's not giant, but for Vermeer, this is significant. 
Um, and this was probably commissioned by his patron. So what is interesting about this, again, you, we're getting this, it looks incredibly real, but it is a constructed real. It's an artificial reality that he's giving us, just like all of his contemporaries. So you get, oh, I'm sorry, I got something in there. Sorry. Um, so we get this very accurate observation of the light, right? You get these incredible cloud formations that you can actually identify the cloud formations in Dutch landscape painting. Um, you get the truth of the light and the way that light works. You get the shadows and the reflections. We know that this is actually in the morning because of the light, because the light, the sun is to the east, to our right. Um, Again, we get this suspended moment in time. So how do we know that the, again, this is the temporality is added to the scenes through the clouds because the clouds move. The clouds are not static. Um, and the pattern of light, right? That they form on the water is gonna change. It's momentary. Um, then we get the truth of the city to an extent. We get these, Boats, which are herring boats, and there's a huge herring fishing industry in Delft. Uh, there's also a very important travel industry in Delft, which is why we get the barge over here. So there is a line, Delft to The Hague, which goes every two hours and transports about 170,000 passengers a year, which is, you know, very modern for the time. So all of this is the truth. And the churches that we see on the skyline are also the truth. But the way that we see these two churches are uh, subjective, and that's Vermeer's subjectivity. So this is the old church, and it's almost hidden. We get this as almost like an, a shadow on the clouds. And this is the new church, which is really, really illuminated, very bright. So why would we get them this way? Uh, why is he emphasizing one over the other? Well, the new church is where um, the it's the it's where William of Orange, who's called the father of the fatherland um, of the Dutch Republic, this is where he is buried. So it's very very important conceptually for this Dutch city that that it is there. And then another thing that is completely made up is this serenity, this calm at, in the port, which is the busiest area of the city. So it looks like a snapshot of reality, but it is a subjective snapshot. You have the categories of the domestic chores. This one is in the Rijksmuseum, the milkmaid, 1657 to 58. So in the 60s, there is a style shift. And you now get minimum details and very simplified compositions. Um, so the vanishing point is right over her arms. So the fact that she's pouring milk, whatever she's doing, is the focus of the composition. So who are we seeing here? This is actually modeled on Vermeer's family maid. So this is an actual person. Her name is Taniki Everpole. Um, she actually existed. She was not Vermeer's mistress. She was just a maid. And she's a kitchen maid here. She's not a lady's maid, but she's a maid of all work. She's wearing the work sleeves, which would be worn over your dress to protect it from dirt and stain. Um, now, within the Dutch literature of the period, maids are symbols of the sort of a threat to the family life, the subjects of male desire. The fact that she's pouring milk, milk, there's a slang for milk that means to sexually attract, to lure. So there are all of these undertones, again, of love, uh, passionate affairs. Then you have this little box. This is a foot warmer, which means that this is a well-to-do family because you need the foot warmer if the kitchen is not heated, which means they have a hot kitchen for daily cooking and a cold kitchen for pastries and confectionaries, which needs to be kept cold because butter will melt. But she has a foot warmer, which is at the time called Love of the Ladies. And it's, a, you know, the text that accompanies this sort of passage about the foot warmers in the emblem books 
goes as follows. In winter, women love their warm stoves. If a man comes along, the foot warmer, though he may do his utmost, he can at best take second place. So there is a sort of a recognition of the symbolism of the maid and the sling of the milk. And you have on these tiles at the bottom, you have Cupid with his bow in between the foot warmer and her skirt. But the foot warmer actually stands for this sort of denial of carnal love. What we do have in the center, what you do have at the vanishing point, at the focal point, is the process of making pudding in the Dutch oven. This is what she's doing. And the way that you make this pudding is you take the broken pieces of bread, which are not really used anywhere, that are completely sort of useless, and you make them into a confectionery, something that is gonna be a sustenance that people are gonna enjoy. So one of the prides of the Dutch Republic is the Dutch milk. 16th century, in the 16th, since the 16th century, half of rural households and third of urban households produced butter and cheese. So they need a lot of milk. You have these small farms and they store raw milk, obviously. They haven't invented pasteurization and they bring it to the market. And it is the Dutch milkmaids that are noted for their hygiene. Dutch milk is considered to be the best in Europe. So what you have here is the sort of metaphorical painting of a Dutch feminine virtue, right? Remaking something useless into a useful product. And that is done, you know, also by uh, referencing this virtue of cleanliness, right? Which is next to godliness, obviously, in the Protestant, in the Dutch household. So this is another example of the chores and another example from the 60s. This is at the mat, young woman with the water pitcher. So she is pouring some water from this pitcher into the basin to wash her hands. Now, it is the most amazing painting because at this point, mid 60s, he basically abandons geometry as a, as a guiding sort of thing. And he switches to color and to light. And it becomes almost abstract, really. It's remarkably modern in the way that he paints. So to go back to the question about colors here, you can see how he adds blue shadows to the white objects, to her head covering. And here you can see in this basin and in the picture how other colors are reflected in the surface. There is the rug on the table that's reflected. There is this blue that's reflected in the picture. And at the bottom of the picture, if you zoom in, this is where you get these discs of blindness, discs of confusion, which completely dissolve the surface. And it's almost like liquid light here. So he becomes almost abstract in, his, in, in the way that he paints. So what's the uh, interpretation here? The silver picture, which is gilded here, and the silver basin and light coming through the glass, not disturbing the glass, but coming through. All of these are biblical symbolism of Virgin Mary's purity at conception. How, you know, it's all about her virginity and her purity and her virtue. So the ideal Dutch woman in an ideal Dutch household um, with the ideal virtue of purity. And of course, it's constructed for a male viewer. I think this is the last one I wanted to show you. So this is the girl with the pearl earring, 65. And this is a completely separate genre that exists in Northern Europe. And these paintings are called tronies or tronian. They are not truly considered finished paintings as such. They are finished. They're just not, they're sort of considered a little bit below in terms of status because they are produced by the artist to entice potential clients as a showcase, as sort of as a business card uh, to showcase their technical skill. And he keeps them in his studio and then if a client comes in, they can buy it. They are based on people that exist, but they are not intended as portraits. And uh, how do you identify Tony? It's usually somebody who is in a fanciful dress, 
uh, and or making some sort of a face, like this very expressive emotional thing um, that, that is showcasing that the painter can produce emotions in his work. So why are we stuck on this painting culturally? collectively. Um, it's because, again, it's a later work and he's becoming more and more light driven to the point here where we don't have any lines in this painting. You have the shifts in color, very subtle shifts, but sometimes you don't even get uh, the sort of the end of one object once that object begins. So if you zoom into her nose on one side, on this side, it's flipped here. There is no line where the nose ends and the cheek begins. Do you see it here? It's almost like a continuation of one into another. So there is sort of this sort of um, obfuscation of distinction. There are no lines here. And here there is shadow, but again, it's very hard to tell where the nose ends. Um, he also, the way that he's become more abstract is that again, there is this reduction of the range of light and darks in color. So if previously we could tell which fabric it is, it's impossible to tell here. It's like very broadly done blue band of the turban, um, lapis lazuli. And then again, you have this amazing light that he's developing here. Um, so the light and the broad technique together creates this effect of immediate presence. So you have the highlights, which means we we feel like we're in the moment that the light hits your face. So it's this very sort of immediate experience here. So where are the highlights that make her come alive? There are highlights in her eyes, right? That makes them lively. There are two highlights in this earring, which is actually a fake earring. He wouldn't be able to afford this pearl. Nobody, I think, would. So you have the highlight that comes somewhere from the left, right? We can tell that the light is there because that's the way that it hits her face. So there is a light that comes from the window and then you have this white, which is the reflected white from the color that's also been illuminated from the window. So it's this particular teeny tiny moment in time where that happens. Then you have two tiny highlights on the side of her lips and the larger highlight in the center of the bottom lip. So what are the things that are dynamic? It's the eyes and the mouth, right? The eyes are alive and the mouth, which is also half open, means we are witnessing a split second event. Why is the broad technique important? So it, what it makes us do is to not get stuck on the details. There are no details. It's all sort of broadly done. And so it's called the essentialist approach. It makes us, us step back and sort of consume the image in its totality. So it creates the immediacy of presence um, once again. So this is actually, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, I, I went over, over the time limit. Um, Thank you. Thank you for showing us some more. All right, any, any questions, any comments? Hopefully. I have a quick comment. Yes. Before right now, if you had asked me about this painting, I would have said that it was, there was quite a lot of detail in it. Yeah. But well, when you point it out, I mean, there's no detail in her nose, nostril, there's no detail in her teeth, there's no detail on her eyelashes or eyebrows. There's there are no details hardly at all. It's very, it's, it's distilled. Right, we have the face, we have the eyes and the mouth, we have the pearl, and we have these broad sort of areas of color of her turban and whatever she's wearing. Um, but it's not a meticulously done painting, especially if you look at it within the context of his other works, right? His earlier works, which are much more cluttered, much more detailed, where each surface is different from, from another which is, you know, it's just the evolution of the artist. It's not better or worse. It's just sort of a, a change, a shift. So hopefully this gives you an idea into who Vermeer is as an artist. And thanks. May I'm I sorry. 
There yes. was one, one comment in the chat. I don't know if you want to address this now. The question is, how would you summarize why Vermeer is different than all those other Dutch painters who worked at the same time? Huh. Uh, well, I mean, that's impossible. <laughs> I don't think it's possible for me to say how he's different from everybody else. There are people who do similar things, but his genius, I think, is making um, is making all of these sort of achieving all of these objectives with less and less tricks, right? By the time we get to the girl with the pearl earring. It's a, an incredibly simple work. There is nothing really to it, which I think is what grabs the attention and how it, it, you have Rembrandt, right? Another giant of the time um, who is also interested in light, who is also interested in this sort of absorbed, solitary, emotional labors of humanity. But in Rembrandt, you get the mystery, right? You get the candlelight, you get these sober dramas. What you get in Vermeer is serenity more than anything. And this incredible genius of constructing harmony, of constructing perfection, really. You look at Vermeer and you sort of like, I don't know how he does it, but there is nothing to add and nothing to subtract. It is somehow the sort of heaven. It, and that's why I think people just, in museums, these are the paintings where you see people get stuck. Doc, um, quick question. Yes. Um, he's, he's obviously here getting um, bold with his brush. Um, and it seemed to me it's obvious that, and I'll, although I've never read or heard anybody say it that he was using very small brushes obviously he did when his with his detail but yeah. he's getting bolder with his brush stroke here as he switched to a larger um oh, uh, that, of that brushes stump me i don't know i think so i think just looking at it i think he has to be working with the wider brush but i i'm sorry that's not <laughs> i don't know i think i think he's not really you know, married to an idea of a certain brush. Right? Arena, there was a show with lots of Vermeers here in Washington recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came up was there was a, a painting that was attributed to Vermeer that they just decided mm -hmm. was actually not a Vermeer. Yes, it's, yeah. uh, it's I think, a girl in a red hat. Um, so I, I mean, there are things that, you know, it's a political decision as, in as much as it is a sort of a scholarly one. So you have an opinion, you do the research, you do the chemical testing, uh, but if it's in a museum and the museum identifies it as a premier, they're not gonna let it go very easily. <laughs> because mm -hmm. let's say they have six premieres and now they're just supposed to say they have five, and it's not really, I don't think we're at the point where you can prove it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like, he, if, if we Vermeer can, didn't sign his work, did he? No, I don't think he did. Well, I don't think he did. Again, because he was a local artist, really. So he was, they knew who he was. Um, and he had this one major patron who would buy his work. So... I'm sorry. Hearing something. Okay. Um, yes, I don't know what I'm answering now. Okay. Any any other questions? Arena, thank you so much for yes. taking time out of you know to support RAL and to share you know information about Vermeer. It's there my, were some paintings that you showed us today that, you know, I hadn't seen before. And, and that's such a gift. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very, very much. It's always a pleasure. And uh, Happy New Year to my Jewish people, if we have any in the audience. Uh, Rosh Hashanah starts tomorrow, I think. Yes.
Yes, yeah. thank you very much. So it's like 5,000 something, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so Happy New Year. Thank you. And, and, and thank you again. Thank and you. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll see you over at a, a Rockville Art League show in the not too distant future over at Glenview Mansion. Thanks uh, again. I would be happy. Thank you. Thank you.